practice. So what I want to do before I get into the topic is to just share with you some of my own personal frame of reference. And um, I do that because I think it's really important to include a lot of our life experiences along the way as Indigenous peoples on what we're doing, what we're, you know, what we're doing presently. You know, the things that have kind of influenced us, our background, our training, our colleagues, our families, our communities. And um, so, yeah, so I'm a Swampy Cree First Nations person. And uh, that th there are many, we're the largest tribal group in Canada. And we actually go from coast to coast to coast in terms of our, our traditional lands but there's several dialects of Cree, and I'm the northernmost Cree uh, tribal group. And so uh, my community is called Cumberland House in northern Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, that's really a frame of reference that I begin all my work from. But I am also a professor of Indigenous Studies at the university, where we teach on topics of uh, such as Indigenous feminism, Indigenous ways of knowing, food sovereignty, on the topics of health and history, disaster mitigation, Indigenous research methodology, which has methodologies, which has gotten a lot of um, coverage in the last decade or two, and of course, Indigenous languages, along with a host of other topics that, you know, each of us within our different research areas are, you know, fairly knowledgeable about. And in, in Canada, Indigenous Studies has a really interesting history because Indigenous Studies was not always there. When I was a young undergraduate student, for example, in Southern Ontario, I had to travel thousands of miles to go to the first Indigenous Studies program at a very tiny university. And that was really formative for me because I met Indigenous students, young people from all across Canada that came there for the same reason that I did. And, you know, it was like a bomb went off in my brain, and I'm sure with them too, that we realized our commonality. But we also, for me, it was <clears throat> the time when I realized that uh, the people of James Bay, the James Bay Cree in Northern Ontario, Quebec, were fighting this large super mega dam. And, you know, they were very much non-industrialized people. They were people that were really from the land, as our language for, it, you know, says about who we are as people of the land, people of the earth. And it was an extremely political and, of course, social and cultural moment to spend time with some of these colleagues to understand, you know, what they had to lose in terms of what the mega dam would mean to their traditional lands. And, and for me, you know, it was a really important politicization event. That was the first time. So today, I'm also a board member of Seed Change Canada, which is a national um, volunteer board I, I uh, volunteer on, and Cultural Conservancy, which is a US-based non-governmental agency. And both of these organizations work really soundly around the preservation of biodiversity, small farmers' rights, women farmers' rights, seed saving, and environmental um, um, pres preservation. So I'm really happy to um, be on those two boards because I learn so much and I really get strengthened in the work around biodiversity that I'm currently involved in, in my academic teaching, etc. I think as a scholar, it's really important for me to keep both feet on the ground in the community with the people that are really, you know, 
being treated not equitably, you might say, like a lot of Indigenous peoples throughout the globe. We share those commonalities of marginalization and poverty. So these two volunteer boards that, you know, are quite large, actually, and we support projects throughout the globe around small grant giving and seed exchange and uh, just, you know, telling their powerful stories of resilience and resistance to a dominant development model that really, you know, keeps them on their knees many times. <clears throat> I'm also an advisor with the Indigenous Climate Action Network. And my main focus there is around food sovereignty. I'm an adjunct professor at the Nat Natural Resources Institute at the University of Manitoba. And here I get the privilege of working with international students from throughout the globe who uh, either through master's or PhD um, studies, I get to be on their committees and really listen to the important research that they are doing in the fields, you know, in Africa, Asia, India. So I really value my role as an adjunct professor there. For me as a professor, it really keeps me current on what these brilliant young minds are doing. And I learn so much uh, from their research and development. And I'm also able to share my own work. Um, just wrapping up 2019-20 uh, David Suzuki Fellowship. And most people have heard of David Suzuki, but probably most people haven't heard of his program of uh, fellowships. So we're a small group of uh, folks that do research around climate change. And my project with my northern community of trappers was is to study the impact of climate change on traditional economies, uh, hunting, trapping, fishing. And I'm just finishing that report now. So it's really, I, mean, I should have it in by the end of the week. And it's really current on my mind of uh, the stories that I heard from some of my relatives and people from my community about the state of the traditional economies around food production and um, I don't know, some economic endeavors. Safe to say, you know, the economy, the traditional economy is not in great shape and, and it's largely because of the Western forms of development, which I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about in this presentation. I am also a member of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is largely a non-Indigenous group that focuses on how to do policy that really addresses marginalized lives and women's lives and Indigenous lives and, and forms of governance that work for the people. Um, so we do some, some really important research, uh, such as alternative budgets, like budgets that steer away from the mainstream kinds of budgets, both national, federal, provincial, and municipal. Uh, because we believe there is alternative ways to organize societies and things like budgets are very integral to how we organize our societies. And then lastly, on my frame of reference, I include here that I'm a fabric artist and I uh, work with traditional Cree art forms with a contemporary focus on preserving biodiversity and knowledge. So a lot of my artwork involves uh, insects, uh, embroidered um, plants, uh, you know, flowers, etc. And I find that that is really in keeping with a lot of the modern methodology of community organizing, which is really on one level very um, healing, but also on the other level of culture and um, something that we need in our life to maintain our sanity. So my research has taken me in different regions of the world, including South Africa, South America, the Philippines, South, the South Pacific, including Vanuatu and Hawaii, Peru and Bolivia, India, Asia, uh, with scholarly, but also community-based movements. So um, for example, I did a lot of my PhD research in those countries, uh, taking a section from each of their pages on how to instruct and how to in 
to grade indigenous knowledge systems into higher learning with uh, reference and a uh, um, relationship to community-based groups. So I found when I was in South Africa, probably 15 years ago now, and they had a concept called, or a word called Ubuntu. And Ubuntu has a parallel meaning of a word in our language called Pimatsuwen, which I called one of my books Pimatsuwen. And that is the good life. And similarly, in South Africa, Ubuntu is the good life. So it was a wonderful concept to draw parallels between indigenous and African ways of knowing and compare those to our own here in Canada, as well as other regions of the world, including Vanuatu, Hawaii, and uh, the Philippines, which is where I did some of my work. So that culminated in a book called The Matsuin, which is on the screen in 2013. And, uh, and, and after that, uh, a book called Akimemok, which is our language for persistence, um, is a book on the strength of women. And I had worked with all of these women that I interviewed for the book. And it occurred to me that none of their stories were being told. So I sat down with them and I interviewed them and had their stories transcribed into this book. So that's, it's out of print now. The Unfortunately, the publisher uh, had to go into receivership, but it's still available. And then recently, of course, Indigenous Food Systems, Concept Cases and Conversations, published by Canadian Scholarly Press out of Toronto, which is the marvelous story of 15, approximately 15 communities throughout Canada that are building to revitalize their food systems. And I mention this fact that all of the stories were told by women. And I think what we are seeing in the world today is a huge and powerful movement of women-centered leadership particularly around foods. And I think in part that comes from the fact that we have groups like La Via Campesina, which represents 150 some small scale uh, food growing societies throughout the globe. And these women organized in the beginning around family violence. And I've told this story because it's very relevant in our communities. And their very primary premise was that family, women, violence has to stop. And it has to stop if we are going to be building strong families, egalitarian systems, that who is ever is doing the battering and the violence against women has to stop. On a very practical level, it has to stop because when women and children are beaten, there's no food production, there's no harvesting, there's no seed saving. And so just on a very practical level. So this was kind of a primary um, view of how food sovereignty organized, that if we're gonna have food sovereignty and ultimately community and indigenous solidarity or sovereignty, it's gotta start with the protection of women and children. So a lot of this knowledge that, and anyone could, I'm sure on this, um, on this webinar could relate to the issue of relationality, relationality, that we are only as strong as our relations are next to us. And that what we're seeing currently today in a, uh, with a lot of the crises, including COVID, is really something about the development crises. So the health crises brought on by the food crises, brought on by the development crises, really calls out for what a lot of our migrant workers in Canada today are calling food justice. So we have what we, in the developed world, so-called developed world, a food justice crises brought on by, or creating an environmental crises. And I'm going to get into some of those statistics in a, few moments. So currently we in the north rely on what is known as an industrial food system that is heavily reliant on pesticides, 
herbicides, Western science, large scale methods of production and distribution, which incidentally are the largest contributors of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas and ultimately climate change. So today we're seeing those vast and scary climate change impacts. I think there's like a hundred, up to a hundred fires. There's so many fires in California at this moment that they haven't even given names to all of them. Usually they do, but there's so many of them, they're just merging into clusters of fires. And, you know, and the same is true in Brazil. And these are directly related to the lifestyle and the lives of Northern and Western governments, what we've created here on the backs of our relatives in other parts of the world. Along with that has been an incredible loss of local autonomy of small farming communities. And, you know, we could all tell our stories about how that has impacted us and our quality of life. But I think what we're here to talk about is what can be done? What is the role of health and education? What is our role as students, professors, knowledge creators? Who is doing what? It's really important we know who is doing what so we don't reinvent the wheel. And how to build those mighty coalitions of solidarity to address our challenges. I know in Canada as a First Nations woman, I realize we're only about 3% of the population. And if things are going to improve for us and for other marginalized peoples, it's because people will act first of all, to understand our issues, and secondly, to act in concert with us, to save our common humanity. Two years ago, I was uh, contracted to uh, do a research for our provincial Indigenous, large Indigenous organization called the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. They wanted me to develop a food sovereignty framework for them to do to um, do three focus groups to find out in three different parts of the province to find out what the issues were for people vis-a-vis -vis food security, food sovereignty, and then to make a set of recommendations. So in that paper, I looked at the intersections of food production, food justice, and climate change. And one of the things I noted in the um, northernmost focus group was that Climate change was very much at the heart of food insecurity, but as was uh, Western development, the building of large mega dams, the clear cut forests, the mining, the exploration that was scaring large animals out of our communities and making them travel everywhere out of the province actually. At the same time, it was also foundational to the local community garden projects, as I no longer live in my traditional community, which is actually about three hours from where I currently make my home. So I was involved with, my family was involved with the community garden movement, which was an amazing um, organization of energy and good food. And then around that time too, I organized two international food sovereignty conferences and two indigenous knowledge conferences, including one on science knowledge. So the last two decades, I've been kind of really into organizing these kinds of venues where we can come together, have dialogue and learn from each other. So here we have the cover of the uh, report called Maskegi Mitsuin, which in my language is medicine food. So food, unlike food produced for a capitalist society, is actually a medicine. It's very much like a lot of our cultures, I'm sure is built around um, service to community, is built around um, ceremonies. Food is viewed as sacred, not to be wasted, uh, to be freely gifted. And contrast that with what the first world view on food, which is strictly for profit, you know, get the means of production and, and really monopolize the production and the distribution and even something as so-called benign as the green plan was very unproductive in terms of sharing the wealth and power of that green revolution. So when we look at 
um, you know, the history and what's happened in our communities, we see a lot of commonalities. So this paper, as I wrote, it has the struggle for land and freedom at its core. As the large contributors to the world's food origins, indigenous peoples are pushing back against powerful forces that have everything to do with intellectual property rights, land rights, and basic survival. As this and other studies have shown, environmental degradation is a powerful force in First Nations lives here in Canada and fundamentally impacts what it is to be Indigenous. It, for us, has meant poisoned environments and eventual loss of access to safe traditional foods. The powerful message of this study is that while communities suffer, Indigenous knowledge is very much alive and has the power and capability to influence and reverse the trend of a suffering world. Indeed, it is this dearth of knowledge and value systems that will save the suffering of a world taxed and stressed almost beyond no return. To ensure the continuity of that knowledge and to grow hope in communities, First Nations need to have advocacy by leadership to take bold action to ensure our future. And part of that is the creation of powerful alliances and allies, which is what we were do, are doing at today's conference and over the next, over these three days. I want to talk a little bit about the Canadian pivotal historical events in part motivated me to jump on this journey of food sovereignty. In Canada, early government policies deliberately undermined Indigenous sovereignty. And this is clearly outlined in a book called Clearing the Plains by James Dashja. And in it, he talks about summarily how Indigenous um, communities were really underdeveloped. You know, they, they had traditional economies and some of the best foods ever. But if you fast forward to today, you see like great suffering and it wasn't always that way. So James Daschuk, who teaches here at the University of Regina in, in Saskatchewan has documented, gone painstakingly through files and, and, and just really um, recorded and written about the history of how indigenous communities uh, were undermined in terms of food production. The same with Sarah Carter, who talked about the, the role of early government and how it undermined Indigenous communities and really tore them apart through um, the devaluing of Indigenous women. And uh, part of that was, of course, tied in very deeply with the church and early governance. And so we have a situation where um, families were torn apart in the name of Christianity and sent off to boarding schools where they were horribly, horribly um, treated, mal badly treated, including my own family. So this has only come to light in the last decade of the extent of those horrors where, you know, 150,000 children were sent away and it was precisely to make sure they didn't speak their language and they lost connection with their parents. And we are still dealing with that aftermath today. We have, you know, pretty deeply established psychosocial problems based on that horrible time in history. And if that wasn't enough, some of the early unethical food experiments that were currently under uh, covered uh, or discovered by Ian Mosby, our young um, ally, uh, really points to why there's so many current health impacts today in our communities, such as epidemic diabetes. So our people were being uh, experimented on through food uh, deprivation and vitamins and lack of dental care. And it, it is conditions that we continue to suffer currently. Then there's this, uh, the UN approach at the, um, some of the world forums. 
And what I learned at that time in the early 90s was there were communities out in the world that were saying no to this method of development, particularly around intellectual property rights of our peoples. Because at that time, the global governance structures and systems that we currently live with today were really pulling people to their knees, um, trying to write into international trade agreements and other conventions and diminishing the role of Indigenous peoples' knowledge and rights. And we discovered that as we attended at some of these international fora. And we, of course, met. And we would meet every year and we would learn more and more and more. And, and actually, when I think back, it wasn't that I intended to do a PhD, but it, I was going to these meetings and learning from everybody else what amazing work was being done. And I said, this really needs to be documented. So that was kind of the the reason why it culminated in a PhD. I was listening to the stories of people on the ground and just blown away. And I learned about things like no patents on life that came out of India that really saved our bacon in many ways, that the, that the small farmers of India said, it's ludicrous to think you can patent life like you do a toaster in a mousetrap. Patents aren't intended for life and they fought both Africa and India fought powerfully to resist that and they won. And so for us in the so-called developed world, this again was a really good lesson to show the power of the people on the ground. And this led to things uh, in our communities like the people's food policy, which I've helped to draft the indigenous part of, and our local Sask food charters, which were really inspired um, out of the um, Naya Laney um, International Forum for Food Sovereignty and the Atitlan Declaration of 2002 and the pre previous one of 2007, where, it, where Africans and Indigenous from uh, Latin America were really spelling out a very critical analysis of what the problems were in very clear terms. And again, you know, we were so humbled to learn about their amazing power and how they articulated it. And these were starving communities. I mean, these were, you know, people that were losing so many hundreds of souls from starvation. And uh, they, I think they strengthened in ways the foundational struggle of what we today um, kind of claim for the Indigenous food sovereignty movements. So <clears throat> in my class on Indigenous food sovereignty, <clears throat> I always make a point of saying that, you know, what do Indigenous peoples globally bring to food sovereignty? Well, simply everything. Indigenous peoples' contribution to world food is seldom recognized, the intellectual traditions and values. And the two values in my culture, known as Wakotuin and Pematsuin, are ones that reflect relationship and care for the natural and human world. And one that is um, freely gifted knowledge as opposed to profit driven. And I know in India, this is a really common um, knowledge of Sitadriya where you know, we do for the greater good. And we have similar values like that. I mentioned Wakotwin, which is a term that we are all related. Uh, where we don't do things just for our good. We do it for the greater good. We do it to help our relatives. And these are values that have not been lost, despite, you know, the years that many of the churches and early governance structures worked hard at trying to destroy that. These are values that still exist that we owe to the world to bring sanity to the world through telling, explaining, and living those principles. Because we know, as academics, we know that these facts are not acknowledged in formal education, and that is our job to do that. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about some of the environmental losses today because it's really, I mean, we are on the edge of a literal collapse of the environment. And I'm gonna just go into some of that data right now. And it's largely around, you know, the whole Western development. And in Canada, I can talk for hours about that. 
So I mentioned before our industrial agriculture food system, which uses massive amounts of pesticides and industrial fertilizers, chemicals, and they're all reliant on fossil fuels, which produce greenhouse gases and climate change. And, you know, um, we need to turn that around. We need to, um, first of all, get off the grid and, and start developing as higher institutes. We need to look at the power we have within our capacity, within our, our education, our universities, and decide how are we going to turn this reliance on fossil fuels around? How are we going to develop more sustainable green energy? And who is in control of production and the distribution of food, which equals food justice, which is a terminology that I borrow out of the migrant uh, veg, uh, food and vegetable workers here in Canada. We are seeing a catastrophe with food production in Canada today, especially around COVID. We are seeing a uh, disaster with these huge meat mills where you know uh, workers are getting COVID and being forced to work. And we don't even know the impact that that's gonna have on our health. Like we're gonna see a lot of scary things into the future if we don't examine our food production systems and how to do things more sustainably. So here's a picture of that lovely book that was pulled together. And the front artwork um, is done by a cousin of mine and she, is picturing, painted a picture of women producing in a traditional dish called pemmican. And I love that, that picture because it really, it says so much about women and communities and young women working together in families. And so that's the cover of the book. The 2018 Living Planet Report says that global wildlife populations have fallen by 60% in the last four decades. That's very chilling. In Canada, mammal populations have dropped by 43%, amphibian and reptile populations dropped by 34%, fish populations have dropped by 20%, and some types of birds have lost between 43 and 69% of their populations. That amounts to 200 to 300 species that we are losing per day. And the last count, it was stated that we have lost over 1 million species lost to date. We have lost more species in this past 100 years than ever in the history of the world. And here's why. Well, here's pictures of the wildfires in Australia. This is an older picture, but still, you know, it, it really was very scary, those fires. And still, we don't get adequate coverage about what's really happened since then. On top of that, close to two and a half million Canadians are food insecure. And that should be a national uh, crisis. It's not. Farmers and fishers are going out of business. Our natural environment is being pushed to the limit. The treatment of Indigenous people is a metaphor for the treatment of nature. Hundreds of thousands of species have disappeared uh, throughout the world. And we are, as Indigenous people, the most flooded, damned, deforested, mined, and sites of toxic dump sites that have ruined traditional harvesting, hunting, and fishing communities. And my community of Cumberland House is a really prime example of that, where a dam went upstream in 1926. And the, the impact was almost immediate. And in the early, in the 19, 1981, I was teaching up there in high school. We had 17 attempted and, and accomplished suicides among our youth. And it was directly related to the fact that we had lost, for the most part, our way to sustain ourselves through traditional economies. And it was not, it was, it was a very horrible time of year. And we probably have the highest suicide rate in all of Canada. 
So it's not only, so when we talk about disappearing species in the treatment of nature as a metaphor, we're talking about 1,500 minimum Indigenous women murdered and disappeared as a reflection of the treatment of nature that we do here in Canada. Our Alberta tar sands have been called the most destructive project in the world, which are directly on Indigenous lands. Never before have there been, had been 23 unknown cases, unknown types of, of counters in these communities. They, the, the, the holding ponds to the tar sands were leaking. They had holding ponds that were so big, I'm gonna show you pictures, that they were leaking into the Athabasca River. And our people, Cree and Dene people, still live off the fish. And, you know, within 10, 15 years, there were 23 previously unknown cancers that came out of that region. And there's nobody to charge. So, you know, it's it's chaos. It's the same with floods. Um, we have parts of our north and Manitoba where hundreds of dams have been built flooding traditional communities. And, and sometimes the governments will bring whole communities down to big major centers and people languish. People live in hotels. People, you know, really many commit suicide. So it's, again, it's a disaster, capitalism. And today there is a major signing of a major contract to clear cut almost every last tree out of the region where I, where I live part-time in the north. And here's pictures of those clear cuts that are just adjacent to where I am tonight. And um, Sylvia McAdam, who started Idle No More about seven years ago, she's in the lower left-hand corner, and that's all clear-cut timber from her trap line and her father's trap line on the right, uh, right-hand top corner. That's her dad. He's now deceased. But he's staring at his trap line there, and he just he can't believe it. And then on the left, at the top is an entire clear cut. And so if you fly over our northern forest, this is what you see. And of course, it's having devastation on our traditional economies and animals that are just. So what are the scientists saying? Well, more than 15,000 scientists from 184 countries have issued a warning that humankind must take immediate action to reverse the effects of climate change, deforestation, and species extinction before it's too late. The warning, which was issued by the Alliance of World Scientists and published in Bioscience, comes on the 25th anniversary of a similar warning from the Union of Concerned Scientists that was titled World Scientists Warning to Humanity. The new letter, however, has 10 times as many scientists endorsing it. And I know that a lot of scientists, our colleagues got mobilized after we had a very bad spate of a conservative government that really cut back on the research that these science, scientists were, uh, were not entitled to do because they didn't get funding. He simply cut, one of our prime ministers simply cut off funding to important scientific research. So my mentor, David Suzuki, in a keynote address here on campus on climate change has described that humanity may last to 2100, but that by 2050, we may see half of the world population disappear. That's not likely in my lifetime. It is in my grandchildren's lifetime. At the same time, Indigenous land protectors are being arrested, charged, jailed, killed, criminalized all over the world. So one of the things that Suzuki, through this fellowship, is asking us to do is just to design sustainable policies and talk about sustainable practices and so identify who the culprits are and how, who the allies are, of course, too. So in a report by Glo food on food justice by Global Witness, and they're 
a remarkable organization that are globally based. Agribusiness is one of the culprit. Um, agribusiness business which earns revenue from agriculture and had the most deaths associated with it, with a reported 46 activists killed in disputes over large-scale agricultural projects, sometimes known as land grabs. And I'm sure people that are listening have had experience with palm oil farms and other huge land grabs. Um, land grabs also take place in our province because let's face it, agriculture is well organized and well fueled. So the agribusiness was followed by the oil and mining industry, which has historically been the most dangerous field for activists with 40 killings. And you know, as a young woman in the 70s, I was traveling throughout Latin America, and that was the other pivotal point in my politicization and training. When I discovered from Mexico to Ecuador, communities that were experiencing genocide, either throughout their history, such as the case of Guatemala, or contemporarily, such as the case of Guatemala and um, Colombia, and many of those countries. And that, for me, really transformed my thinking as an internationalist, that I saw how far the state was willing to go literally killing people in order to have power and control over our lands and our resources. Poaching and logging were tied with third for 23 reported deaths each. And according to the International Environment Organization, 2017 saw a total of 207 killings of environmental activists or defenders. And these are numbers are very mild. I mean, the actual killings we know are much higher, and these are actually uh, older uh, statistics. But whenever I give talks, I always say, you know, Indigenous peoples, defenders of the land, are the people who are being criminalized, battered, and we see it daily on Fox TV news, uh, where, you know, those that are coming as allies are also being criminalized and thrown in jail. And um, it's really important to have these conversations because, you know, we are just standing up for the earth and we are paying dearly with our lives. Uh, I'm almost done. So I'm just going to say a few things about water as life because water, of course, is a so-called commodity that's been under stress. The UN report reported in 2015 that the demand for water will increase by 55% over the next 15 years. By that time, global water resources will meet only 60% of the world's demand. As of 2016, there were in Canada 163 drinking water in place in 119 First Nations in Canada. That number has only lowered slightly, I think, to 140. So today, there are that many communities, First Nations community, in a rich and powerful country like Canada, where some mothers cannot even bath their little babies. And there's a story of a mom that had a little baby that had sores all over her body from the water. She had to literally bath that baby with bottled water. Can you imagine that? So what we need is a strong national plan of action based on a new water ethic that puts water protection and water justice at the heart of all of our policies and laws. I mean, we are seeing all throughout the world today the privatization of water. In Bolivia, I think 15 years ago, the water was privatized, but the indigenous people of that country protested and all chaos erupted, and they were able to turn that decision around that water was no is no longer privatization, although under the current regime that might have changed. But so we know that water all over the world 
is under threat of privatization and that is increasingly in more demand as agribusiness takes over the, the, the ownership of it. So it's something that we really, as food sovereigntists, need to be mindful of. And you know, we've dumped whatever we wanted into our water, diverted it from where, where it was needed to sustain a healthy ecosystem to where it was convenient for industry and urban populations or to, to you know, grow golf, golf, what do they call those where they play golf? We've dredged wetlands and canals and built mighty dams, hardened shorelines, moderated watershed levels and modified waterways once in the name of survival and now in the name of economic gain. So here's one of the culprits, the, the Alberta tar sands. And these tractor things are so big, you can't even see human standing next to the tire because the tires are so big. This is like massive. And these are the tar sand pools that are so big and so um, toxic that one year a bunch of ducks landed in that and they were just imme you know, almost immediately died covered in grease and oil. And so now they've got, they put water cannons in that go make these loud noises every, every so often to scare the animals away. But you know, animals still find their way in there and die. And they're so big they can be seen by satellite from outer space. And here's a sample of fish that one of our gentlemen pulled out of these, these very toxic waterways. That's a tumor on that fish. I want to say just a little bit about urban migration because we all have familiarity with that. Urban migration is largely due to poverty, unemployment, and food deserts that are quickly being created in our traditional lands. In my community of Saskatoon, the six lowest income neighborhoods and health disparities have quotes. The magnitude of the disparity in health outcomes found in my city is shocking for a city in the Western world. Infant mortality rate in our core area, low income neighborhoods, was 448% higher than the rest of the city which is worse than so-called developing nations. And this was a study done in 2008. And 448% highest, higher infinite, infant mortality rate than in the burbs where a lot of the non-Indigenous people live. So it's a crisis. It's a human crisis. And the, you know, this isn't just happening because we're somehow deficient as we know it's happening because of these global go governance structures that we are increasingly forced to live live under that are increasingly uh, taking more of the pie the wealth and forcing more and more of us to live in such desperate situations all under the name of capitalism we have a crisis in capitalism and it's being facilitated earlier by the north american free trade agreement and then later by other agreements um, through Europe. And, and these are largely in, to appease the demands of the international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. And we know in some of the regions where people live on this, in this conference, that, that, you know, we are forced to live by the structural adjustment programs that these powerful financial institutions force on us if we want to get any kind of financial aid. And I'm certain people here know more about it than I do, but it's important to view our struggle within this framework of the mighty and the powerful if we are to move forward and reclaim democracy. And for us in the first world, uh, Canada, there's no protection for our treaty territories that were signed with the governments back when Canada was becoming a nation. There's no protection for land or air and water, biodiversity, food, and sacred sites. And in fact, when our province was established, the federal government just handed over all of the resources in our three prairie provinces, 
to the province without unilaterally, without any discussion with First Nations. And we are large in number here. So here's a picture of a woman standing up and in the background are the army. And this picture was taken on the east coast of Canada in Mi'kmaq territory. And in her hand, she's holding an eagle feather and the men are holding guns. And these are the scenes that are increasingly becoming common. And we say, we need to communicate the state of what's happening. We need to see our commonalities of what's happening as we stand up to save land. Because in that knowledge is power. And food, the struggle for food sovereignty is a really uh, important vehicle for that because it's part of a larger global food movement and a way of reclaiming democratic practices within communities and of questioning this neoliberal set of policies that are increasingly you know, enforcing austerity measures, but only austerity measures for the poor and middle income, not for the ultra 1% rich. I already mentioned La Via Campesina, so I won't go there, but I, I wanna just end my talk with a celebration. A few years ago, I was in the Philippines and I walked down to Batat from the top of the mountain ridge. And there I feasted my eyes on these 2000 year old rice terraces. And this is in, um, Maybe somebody from the Philippines can help me. This is in uh, the highlands of where the Igoro people uh, really laid waste to the Spaniards and really um, stopped them from interfering with their sovereignty in many, many powerful ways, including as recently as stopping an IMF dam that would have flooded many of these lovely terraces. So... It was so powerful to be in the presence of indigenous sovereign Igoro people and to see these magnificent terraces. So the UN comes in and I guess they thought they were probably giving them a nice pat on the back. And they said, well, can we claim this as one of the wonders of the world and put a little sign up? And the people of this region said, we don't care what you call it but you're not going to genetically modify our rice because that was a little bit of the sneaky plan was to see if they could actually convince the people to genetically modify and change ownership of their precious rice because a lot of the rice had been uh, genetically modified, but not in this region. So I just wanted to share that image with you. It's a beautiful, powerful image and it's also really reflective of the kinds of strength that so many indigenous people represent throughout the world. Finally, I want to just say a little bit about what uh, some of the work teaching I do around sovereignty and self-determination. And again, it comes from the principles of food sovereignty, but it focuses on development for the people. That if development isn't for the people, I don't want, you know, we need to revisit that. It values people. It values all people. It localizes development systems. And again, I mentioned that the reason why the Green Plan didn't work is because it imported these huge mega systems that produced more food, yes. I think it was said that the Philippines produced a lot more grain, but nobody had access to it because it wasn't being distributed equitably. And so they had a rat problem with all this extra grain. It puts control locally. It ensures that people who live in the region have a say in how things are governed. It builds knowledge and skills. It works with nature and it acts locally but thinks globally. So the importance of this international linkages and networking that we are doing in this next, in these three days, and the importance of our teaching and research is that we can share stories and we can dream and we can plan and we can we can really decide which way forward 
because I heard something in some meeting I went to one time. Maybe it was David Suzuki who said, Priscilla, the world needs indigenous knowledge more than ever, more than ever before we go on an all out collapse. And that's where we are now. And so if I have anything final to say to people present at this conference that continue to keep up your good work, continue to build these important linkages and networking, continue to mobilize and assist the youth in taking care of the elders because that's the only thing that's going to work, that we know that we have very powerful forces that are working against us. But you know what? We represent ancestral knowledge of power and strength and humility and good relations. And we know that that is the thing that's going to work in saving Mother Earth. I think COVID has really level, you know, leveled our world in some respects. But even through COVID, capitalism has managed to take an opportunity to try and, you know, create a, their opportunity. And, you know, I'm personally very scared about the children going back to school and we don't even know, you know, what's around the corner in terms of our health, especially the elders, well, and the little children, everybody. So let's see. Oh, here's an on a on a lighter note. Here's a picture of a sculpting of politicians discussing global warming. Kind of funny. Only their heads are out. We must see our struggles within the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And if you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to Google it, pick it up and, and understand that it came out of a hundred years of development and is still current and very much signed by many of the world's indigenous peoples. And then in closing, I just wanted to highlight two of my young sheroes, Melina Lubakan Massimo, who's one of my fellow uh, Suzuki fellows. And she, as she's awesome, I, I could sit, talk about her for hours. And um, she has long sought to expose the impact of tar sands in her home region, and her work is global. And she established Sacred Earth Solar, formerly Lubicon Solar, which helps Indigenous communities attain energy sovereignty through the use of solar power. And Takaya Bellini, who I've known, uh, she's in her early 20s. She and I were recently in Cuba to celebrate um, decades of socialism there. And um, she is an amazing young woman who's been, again, criminalized because of her uh, work on the pipeline. And she's just an amazing young woman that I think we all need to hold our hands up to. And I think that's it. That's it, yeah. Time is it. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Seti, for an, a really inspiring and passionate and uh, enriching talk that shows us very clearly this uh, natural connection between activism and scholarship that informs uh, everything you do. So thank you so much. And uh, we do have a, a couple questions, please. The first is from um, Puvilang Otai. And the question is, could you comment on the state of democracy across the world and what kind of alternative administra administrative systems could we look up to from the indigenous communities? Oof, that's a big, big question and a big, um, I think suffice it to say that what we're seeing throughout the globe, including Mali this week, <clears throat> is a, um, a claiming back of power. And, um, you know, it's happening in different parts of the world. 
Unfortunately, we don't get news reports of it much. But it really boils down to, at a very micro level, um, whether we have democratic practices in the home, in the community, in the town, in the city, in the nation. And we're up against powerful forces. You know, even our liberal government in Canada, which is slightly better than the previous conservative one, still has allegiances to the rich and powerful. And in many of our provinces, the oil industry has sewed up our leadership, has built allegiances between those. And they have everything to lose if we do reclaim our democracy. And I think we live in a very exciting time now. It's not easy, it's difficult, you know, people are dying through uh, poverty and political activism, uh, particularly Indigenous people that are being jailed and tortured. And so it's scary. I mean, for me, it's, you know, it's a scary world out there. But we still have to do it. And I think that's the thing that I was taught and I continue to remember about the traditional values of our community where we didn't operate as oligarchies, we didn't operate uh, you know, with people who were so greedy. In fact, our communities were built on sharing and making sure that the very weakest were cared for. So I think it's up to each community about how they decide to mobilize and what are some of the foundational principles. And I'm really excited by some of the youth movements that I work with today Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I'm very excited about their notion of, you know, capitalism is not working. We've created a mess of the world. Even the gains that we've made in medicine are moving back to, uh, like we have communities with tuberculosis. We've got viruses now that are going out of control. Like, so we're in some ways we're moving back to be, be, before our, comfort in so-called developed places were uh, developed. We're moving back and this is exactly a reflection of the kinds of not careful development we've embraced. I think ultimately, you know, it's got to include women as an equal voice in the development. And it, it, somehow in our communities, the, this shift is happening. I don't know what's happening. It just seems like most of my students are women. Most of the people who are getting higher learning are women, but we are still losing far too many to a, a bad system. So I think it's, it's time to have these important conversations about what works and what doesn't work. And finally, there is um, a type of social mobilization of economies that I'm part of that, that is throughout the world, and that is mobilization of social economies. Principles that talk very much along lines of what I present today. And uh, students, when I teach that course, students love that course. And, you know, they want to see a different world. They want to, you know, I think, I think the youth are really excited for a new model. And so... I think that there are models out there that have worked in the past, could, could work, and um, it's up to us to, to really learn about it and really work with community to develop it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. And uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, we do have several more questions in the uh, comments box, but um, uh, we have one more time, one more question from uh, time for one more question. So that comes from Dr. Bhumika Sharma. And um, ma'am, how do you think the idea of, of women centric leadership can be actually realized because the perspective of the society in general is still patriarchal? Even many of, uh, of the women seem to con conform to the same. So that's a question from Dr. Sharma. Thank you. Well, I am a grandmother, and in my personal experience, I know that the nuclear family does not work. 
And the best families that work are the ones that include the extended family, including men and uncles and aunties. Those work. And those also free up the parents to be what they can be, even more of what they can be. Not to defy their roles as parents, but to have some breathing room, as everyone knows who are parents. Parenting is a hard work. So we need to extend those kind of support systems outwards to where, and, and we're talking about things like alternative bud budgets or budgets that are women-centered, that, that pay attention to the needs of women and children first. And we can do it. We don't have to uh, put our budgets towards military. We can put our budgets towards things that support communities and families. And that's, to me, a thinking of a feminist. The other thing about feminism, which I also teach about, is that they see the intersections of oppressions. And if we can begin to understand that concept of many oppressions are interlinked and are strengthened by, you know, that fact. <clears throat> so if you have sexism, usually you'll have racism and classism and all the isms, ageism. And so I think, you know, there's some societies in the world that are, are, are so violent against women. And there's some, including our society, that have adopted the violence of the colonizer. And so I think that if we can begin to understand, like through my eyes, the process of decolonization has been really useful for me to understand how to teach through a more egalitarian way of, you know, working with students the next generation and to talk about these real isms of sexism and racism. So that that's... And women, of course, have to work together. And, and men who are feminists need to come to the aid, too. And I know very many good men feminists. So. OK, well, thank you so much, Professor Sethi, for a, a really inspiring session. And uh, we really appreciate your contribution to the conference uh, on Indigenous studies as an international uh, body of knowledge and scholarship. So on behalf of the committee and, and the conference uh, delegates, uh, our sincere thanks for your generous talk today. Thank you. And here's oh. our applause. If you can hear our applause virtually. <laughs> yeah, thank you so thank much. You for your, thank you all 